Okay, welcome everyone um, to our uh, information session on the Secret Agent Society. Uh, my name is Kathleen Davey. I'm the Coo and Clinical Psychologist at the Social Skills Training Institute. And I'm joined today with Deirdre uh, McEverly from uh, the Lucina Clinic in Dublin. And uh, we'll both be taking you through some information on the Secret Agent Society small group program. Uh, and also hear a, a little bit about the really exciting research that they've been doing at Lucina, applying uh, SAS to a range of different types of children. So that for those of you who don't know anything about uh, what SAS is yet, uh, we have three different ways that, that people can access Secret Agent Society. Um, for children aged 8 to 12 usually, uh, originally designed for children with autism or Asperger diagnosis, now used for a range of children. Um, the three options are to, uh, to look at the small group program, which we're focusing on today. Um, the small group program is where you have three to six children with identified social emotional needs. The top of the triangle there is the, the standalone resources of Secret Agent Society that you can use flexibly um, to target specific skills for different children in different settings. And then we also now have options for a whole of class version of Secret Agent Society for all children, even if they don't have identified social emotional needs. So let's, uh, let's get a little feel for what this really is about and the, the Secret Agent theme. I'm gonna play you our uh, computer game trailer so that you can See it in action. Please enter the International Secret Agent Society Headquarters where you will begin your training. Welcome to the International Training Headquarters. You'll be training here with four other rookies. Your mentor special agent, Agent Arden, will give you clues for your training missions. Your mission is to find the black bear. What was that? I need urgent backup. The thieves are planning to strike tonight. Will do, Junior Detective. Congratulations on a job well done. To successfully graduate from this academy, you will need to complete a three-level program that teaches you how to decode people's thoughts and feelings. You will be given home missions to complete between training sessions and asked to document these in a secret agent journal. Hi, my name's Tim. I I'm new to the school. Junior Detective, try activating the shield and muted bullet attachments on your handheld PC. Nice try, boys. But it looks like the joke is on you. I don't think so, nerd brain. Remember, take some slow breaths, stay calm, and control. Working as a team, determine who committed the crime, unscramble the letters, and use this to help solve the mystery. We're going to play the Android adventure game on our handheld PCs. Who would you like to play first? I, I guess I'll give it a go. At least I gave it a go. Your mission is to engage in an air combat attack. Shoot down the enemy aircrafts before they strike you. At this. I want to get out of here! What should your character do to calm down? Okay, I'll try my best. Good luck! So, as you could uh, hopefully see from that, um, Secret Agent Society is just that. It. Your training to be a secret agent um, is the cover story for learning your social and emotional skills. Um, now, we've been distributing Secret Agent Society for 10 years now, um, and uh, Special Agent uh, D here <laughs> has been along on that journey for, for quite some time as well. So, uh, would you like to introduce yourself, Agent D? Thanks, <laughs> Kathleen. Um, my name is Deirdre McEvely and I'm a senior speech and language therapist working in uh, what's called the Lucina Clinic, which is part of the mental health um, service of St. John of God Community Services. 
and we're based in Dublin and Wicklow in Ireland. And we have been on a journey with SAS for almost 10 years too, um, since I first read Rene uh, Beaumont and Kate Zoffinoff's original article back in 2009. And we've come all that way to now completing our um, research study on SAS. Very so exciting. Photos are <laughs> can kind of show how big part of my um, professional and personal life SAS has become um, in the last few years in particular. The, the cake was baked by my friend and colleague, Geraldine Brosnan, for my 40th birthday. <laughs> and the, one the, the one on the right is my um, 41st birthday. And this <laughs> is Health in the Middle and our psychology, clinical psychology colleague, Mary on the left, and that's Geraldine Brosnan on the right when we did a uh, Dublin's mini marathon to raise money for SAS uh, family kit. That's two years ago now. And that was linked to the research study that we'll be hearing about later, isn't it, Deirdre? Yeah, we were raising money for um, the family kits to use within the research study. Yeah. Which, um, the poster photo, um, where was that presented? Um, that was pre presented at the St. John of God Research Conference in Dublin in 2017. So this was an intention to present poster um, where we were outlining the Secret Agent Society program and our intention to research it. Excellent. So we'll be applying this year. So two years later, we'll hopefully be applying to present a paper at that conference with our results. Fantastic. So exciting. So that uh, the research study that um, the Deirdre is referring to there is using the small group program in a uh, child and adolescent mental health service. Um, so let's find out a little bit about what it is that they were running and, and then we can hear about the results that they've, they've had in that Irish population. <clears throat> so small group program, um, as I mentioned earlier, it's three to six children. Um, and there's a, a two-day training course that f professionals uh, do to become SAS facilitators and then they go out and they deliver this or offer the small group program to children and families uh, in their services. And some pictures of some of the resources that go with it on that, that slide there. Um, so it's a, it's a multimedia program. It incorporates computer game, which we saw a little bit of before, a board game, um, group session activities and games. Um, there's a helpful thought missile action game and walkie talkies and all sorts of things that create this multimedia program. Everything's espionage themed, as you can probably tell. And uh, the three categories of skills that we're teaching children and helping them to use in the real world is emotion recognition, so telling other, uh, recognising other people's emotions as well as emotions in themselves, their own emotion regulation or emotion management, and a whole range of social skills and social problem solving, including bullying, um, conversation, uh, conversations and, and playing. Um, there's not only child group meetings, there's also parent group meetings and a series of teacher tip sheets that get given out each module so that we've got the child, the parent and the teacher, classroom teacher all on board with where the child's up to and helping them practice their skills. Um, I, I mentioned earlier it was originally designed for kids on the autism spectrum. Uh, at the time it was Asperger's uh, was the diagnosis, but now it's used with a range of child, uh, children with a range of social emotional skills, such as at the Lucina Clinic. Um, for example, kids with autism, ADHD, anxiety, anger difficulties, and, and other general social and emotional difficulties. Um, part of the small group program is something called the family kit, which is what uh, Deidre and her colleagues went running on that marathon for to raise money for family kits, um, because they wanted to do this study uh, to show what, what SAS could really do. Um, now, the family kits are the consumable part of the program. They're little cards and stickers and and things that the kids have, little emotionometers, so that they can have visual reminders out there in the playground or in, um, out in the community of the skills they've been learning. They have their workbooks that they, uh, they use in group and they look at later. The parents have their own parent workbook which summarizes the information. So not only does it help support them through the stages of the program, but they have that to refer to later on afterwards as well. There's the teacher tip sheets I've already mentioned, the computer game access, um, and it's all kept within, within a gadget pack and a drawstring bag. So there are these family kits 
um, that have everything all ready to go so everyone has what they need when they're, they're learning their social emotional skills. Now, one of those components that I mentioned is the computer game, which has uh, four levels, which we saw little bits of each level in that computer game trailer earlier. Um, as they progress, they are learning those same skills or they're learning the knowledge that we then apply in small group settings. Um, it's meant to be an engagement and a teaching tool. It's certainly not a standalone intervention. The computer game is paired with that small group process. Um, in there is, are also, uh, there's a digital journal for them to report back on their missions. Um, and they usually play their computer game at home or, or at school with adult support. It's not actually in the small group session. Um, now, facilitators, the people who are running it, we have people um, all over the world, and I think it's 11 different countries that we've trained people from now. Um, as you can tell from my accent, we're actually uh, based, the main distributor is based in Australia, um, and we deliver a facilitator training course wherever it needs to be, which um, the Lucina Clinic are hosting a, a facilitator training course in October this year, which we'll give you more information on. So it's a two-day course in order to become an SAS facilitator. Uh, there are some minimum eligibility criteria to attend. Um, but if you're a qualified allied health professional or an educator, like a, te a teacher or a learning support teacher, um, you well and truly meet that eligibility criteria. And you get a certificate at the end that shows families that they are in fact um, working with someone who is trained in this evidence-based um, program. Um, then there's facilitator resources that you can see there, all those games and goodies on the screen. You get a big kit that you reuse uh, with all the kids when you're running the, the program. Now, what I thought I'd do is quickly uh, tell everyone about the type of content and skills that we teach the kids as we go through SAS small group program, um, starting from the very beginning. So in club meeting one, when you get the kids together for the first time, they, they firstly set up their bionic powers which is around their goals and values, um, the bigger picture things that motivate them. And we can link RSA skills into those goals as we go. Then they start to learn how to detect other people's emotions from their face, their voice, and their body clues. And the, the, one of the tricks with this, or to, you'll soon realize, is before they come to this session, we try to get them to play level one of the computer game. Why we do that is level one of the computer game teaches them some of the knowledge around face, voice and body clues that you then apply in session. What also happens is they get, uh, the computer game is the hook, if you will. They're excited, there's a computer game component and we're going to uh, pretend that we're training to be secret agents while we learn. So it engages and teaches, then they come into group where you further practice that and then they'll actually go on missions in between sessions where they practice it even more. Now, club meeting two, they play level two before they come into this one, because level two is um, linking in with detecting emotions inside your own body. What are the body clues we get that tell us that we're angry or anxious? They get emotionometers because we want to start to look at degrees of emotion. I'm not just angry, uh, distrusting, jealous, embarrassed, and bored. I can be a little bit nervous. I can be quite uh, anxious. I can be absolutely terrified. Uh, and then because we're introducing these emotions, we also teach them about relaxation gadgets. The first one is the O2 regulator, otherwise known as slow breathing, but that's not very cool. <laughs> Club meeting three, um, they do more relaxation gadgets. They learn the fire engine, which is about high levels of emotion. They learn about thinking in helpful ways with the helpful thought missile, and also how to notice and let thoughts go that might be distressing or how to focus on the more helpful thoughts through the thought tracker. Club meeting four, we come back together and they finish their relaxation gadgets with the Enviro body scan. We then shift gears. We move into the topic of friendship because we want to prepare the kids for how to choose um, the peers that they are most likely to be able to connect with or, or practice their skills with successfully. Uh, so we set them up for success by teaching them a friendship formula, or they create their own friendship formula, I should say. That's actually on the bottom part of the screen with the confetti and the, and the tube. Um, we also look at understanding different social groups. They do friend profiling, looking at who's similar to me or who likes to do things the same way as me. And they get a friendometer for measuring degrees of friendship. In Club Meeting 5, we, uh, we start to teach what are called the codes, the skill codes. The first one is decoder. It's 
a problem solving formula to help them with social problems. Then they learn something called the conversation code, <clears throat> which is how to talk, have a two way conversation and keep it going. Um, club meeting six, we practice our conversation skills and we look at the play code. In club meeting seven, we look at coping with mistakes or this one's actually called the damage control code which is one of my favourite uh, code names in the program. Um, they also then start practising their skills through the Challenger board game, which is in the bottom part of your screen there. There's a Challenger board game that we start playing in Module 7. We stop where we're up to, Module 8, we start again, we stop, Module 9, we keep going. So they're gradually moving around this board game, um, doing mini missions and practising their skills. And we also do detecting the difference between accidents, jokes and nasty deeds. This is important to be done at that stage before we get to club meeting eight when we do the bully gap body armour. So this is actually a bully management plan or a set of strategies to, to use and to help children to ignore and stay safe and, um, and calm if they are experiencing bullying. Uh, we continue playing that SAS Challenger board game. Then in club meeting nine, we're getting to the end of the intense weekly sessions that are going on here, or they can be um, every two weeks, but usually people run them weekly. Um, club meeting nine is the confusion code. Now this is about change and new situations, okay? Um, so how do you cope when you're faced with something you have no idea about? It's something too new or something's changed. Um, we try to finish the SS Challenger board game. We do review games. Um, we definitely look at planning for future problems because usually there's a gap here. We do intense weekly sessions and there's a gap and then we come up for, come back for follow-up booster sessions. Um, we do one of our program evaluation points here at Club Meeting 9, um, which I'll tell you more about uh, in a moment. Then we do come back for those follow-up meetings. It might be two, it might be four. It's up to the facilitators. We do progress um, updates. There's a lovely self-esteem activity in follow-up meeting one. Um, we look again at how do we plan for what's happening in the future and we do another program evaluation piece. Then uh, follow-up meeting number two is usually six months later or six months after the, the teaching period was occurring. Um, we do another progress update. They have the SAS STARS activity where they prepare something to present at their graduation ceremony summarising what they've learned from SAS. Um, they do another program evaluation and there is a, an actual graduation ceremony where they get their medals, which are featured on the, the screen there and a certificate to say that they've graduated from the Secret Agent Society. <laughs> um, now between all of those sessions, I've mentioned that they go on missions. So missions are a variety of things, um, but after every club meeting, they've got set missions aligned with the programming that's going on at the time. It helps children to learn and apply their skills to real life. Um, it can also help with the collaboration between child and parent, child and teacher and parent and teacher. Um, it can involve playing the SAS computer game. It can involve real life practice tasks, um, like practicing um, your O2 regulator, your slow breathing technique, or um, practicing your play and conversation code skills while you've invited another child to play with you. There's also something called the, uh, the journal and the scene generator where children report back each week on how they went with their missions. So they do them, but they also reflect back on them in, a, in an age appropriate way. Now, parent group meetings, I did mention those. So we've got a series of child group meetings happening. And at the same time, there's a series of parent group meetings happening. And they can happen in different ways. Uh, Deirdre will probably tell us about the way they did it, which is with four two-hour parent sessions. You can also do weekly parent group meetings um, as well. There are options to allow for flexibility. You discuss successes and challenges that the parents have had with children in helping them with their missions uh, between the sessions. Uh, you review the program content. What did the kids learn? How did they go? What are some tips? Um, how can they support their child to use their skills and they have their parent workbook. Then the teachers, as I mentioned, they get teacher tip sheets. They're um, summarising the content from each module so that the classroom teacher knows what the child's been learning and has some tips on how they can support the student in class or in the playground to use those skills. Uh, it can be very, very helpful in the classroom. Basically, um, there's a series of posters as well that teachers could choose to have 
to get up or put up in the classroom to help with that. But otherwise, they just got a quick, easy tip sheet to read through um, with some practical strategies they can apply. There's also strategies for promoting um, peer acceptance. So better reactions and better relationships in general in the classroom that helps that helps with inclusion and helps the child to practice their skills. Um, and there's also something called a skill tracker card um, that's being used to help the child to practice their skills between, between sessions um, that the teacher can be involved in as well. So I've mentioned um, a few things like the skill tracker card. I've also mentioned there's assessment points. So at the beginning of the program, we do a baseline assessment then at the end of the intense weekly sessions, then at the three and the six month point or whenever those follow up meetings are, because there's built in assessment measures in SAS. It's all ready to just use. Uh, on the screen there, you can see the example of a parent questionnaire booklet, a child questionnaire booklet and a teacher questionnaire booklet. So they're all involved in rating and assessing the child's skill growth. And you can add other tools as well if you like to. There's also an optional observation tool um, which, uh, Deidre, did your team use that? No, we and questionnaire. Questionnaire booklets only? Yeah. Because uh, sometimes, um, it's, sometimes it's difficult to, to implement the observational tool if you're not someone who's on site at school with the child, because that's usually the best time to do it. So you, I find that different services find it easier to use that tool or not, and that's why it's optional. Um, and then there's also the skill tracker card that's motivating the child each week. This is lots of assessment and monitoring built in. So it's not only an evidence-based program in that there is lots of research behind SAS, it's also using an evidence-based or scientist practitioner approach while you're delivering the program to assess how things are going and help you to adjust. Now let's hear a little bit about um, how you've been using it at Lachina, uh, Deirdre. Um. Well, it kind of goes back to 2015, Kathleen. <laughs> um, I was on maternity leave, so I wasn't even in routine at that time. I was off work and I had a three month old baby girl. And I had been in contact with Renee Beaumont, the developer, for the previous years, wondering when there would be overseas training. Um, because when I first read that article, I was really struck by how clinically relevant SAS is for a CAMS or child and adolescent mental health service population. Um, the strength of the quantitative results that um, Renee and um, Kate achieved in, in, those, in the early days of the RCT. And also by the innovation in terms of the fact that there was a computer game. So, uh, <laughs> because I knew that uh, how, how that would appeal to the kids. Um, and around that time, but that was back in 2009, um, there was a real paucity of evidence for um, a social communication program. And we had been running social communication groups for years in Lucina, um, but we were always at the back of our mind. What we were trying to do was take bits of other programs and put them together to make them our own to suit the needs and abilities of the kids. So that in itself was very time consuming. Um, and also we weren't really working from an evidence-based platform, which is worrying as a practitioner and as a clinician. Um, and then the, the therapeutic change was very difficult to measure. So although we felt that our group mm -hmm. with the children based on our own outcome measures and qualitative feedback, um, we couldn't really prove it from a quantitative point of view. Um, and the change and generalization and carryover of skills was also really hard to quantify. So when I read that article, it really ticked so many boxes for us. And that's what kind of spurred me on to contact Renee by email. And she replied immediately in terms of overseas training. Um, and then a couple of years went by and I was at a uh, SCAP conference, which stands for the European um, Society of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry Conference. And myself and Geraldine Brosnan were presenting a, a poster on uh, ADHD and language profiles. And another professor at that conference mentioned the SAS program in their uh, literature review. So that spurred me on to contact Kathleen, or to contact Renee again. Um, and at that stage, she put us in contact with a net psychologist in Westford who had done the training. Um, 
this is a very long roundabout, long-winded way of <laughs> bringing me to when I first met you in 2015. And I was on maternity leave and the, you came to Dublin to provide the one day computer game training program. Yes. Where, that's where the actual clinical work started from my perspective um, in Lucina. So when I came back from maternity leave, I did a very adapted, um, just computer game standalone pilot. Um, just with three girls um, who were attending Lucina, so they had a moderate to severe mental health difficulty. Um, and within that, they, two of them had diagnosis of ASD and ADHD, and one girl had ADD. And I did a very simplified version of SAS. I just had the parents in at the beginning and the end, um, and I had, did six sessions of the computer game in clinic with the girls. Um, and got really positive results on the outcome measures from that. Um, the feedback was things like that they had never done anything like that before. The parents had never addressed any kind of emotional regulation difficulties in a computer game format before, um, which was really interesting and motivating for them. And for me as a clinician, particularly as a speech and language therapist, I would never have dreamt of working on emotional regulation with kids prior to SAS. So because our focus is primarily social communication and you know, speech and language needs. So even from a clinician's point of view, I felt that it was broadening our scope of practice. Um, and from a client and parent and family-based point of view, we saw results immediately. Wonderful. So from that, then we um, put a proposal to management to um, attend the two-day training course for the small group program that you were running in Cardiff in Wales. Um, so that was April of 2016, with whom you were trained, myself and Geraldine Brockman with you. Fabulous. And then we came back to Dublin and Wicklow, and we did our own pilot program from, um, I think it was September 2017 to the, September 2016 to the following summer. So we worked with 18 children across two clinics um, in the form of three small groups um, to pilot it to see would this program work for our type of CAMS population. Um, again, we used the SAS outcome measures pre and post and three and six months follow up um, and got really brilliant results on that. So that led us to put a proposal together to um, do a proper research project. So you've done two pilots, one with the computer game pack with a group of three girls and one with the small group program with 18 children. Yeah. Yeah. Um, our, well, the, but the one with the 51 children, which is the one we've just completed. Yeah. Um, the biggest one. Yeah. Um, we expanded our SAS team to include um, another friend and colleague, Katie McGuire, is another senior speech and language therapist. She works in a different clinic, so we wanted to expand our ranges of um, SAS provision. Uh, word had spread by that stage, so the other multidisciplinary teams were wanting SAS within their clinic. Um, so we expanded it and got Katie on board, and we're then able to offer SAS um, in three different locations. Excellent. So then we had a very lengthy, arduous ethical application process. Um, but we got there in the end and we got full permission um, through GDPR issues and everything um, <laughs> to start the project, which began in um, September 2017. Yeah, wow. S such a great story, Deirdre. Um, and I, it's also really um, Lovely to hear another example, um, and yours is very, uh, a very powerful one, I think, of just doing a pilot and how that can help you to lead to bigger things as you're going. Um, and, and then people, as you've experienced, once people use SAS or other people see it in action or they see the results in the families, and then what are you now? You've, now you're out delivering it in three different clinics and have someone from another team on board. You know. Fantastic. Um, now, your, your um, service is also hosting facilitator training in October. Would you like to um, tell anyone who's listening about that? 
Yeah, so you are coming over, Kathleen, again, to Dublin to um, train uh, people who work within Lucina. So we have expanded it. We've got a huge amount of interest within other members of the multidisciplinary team. So that includes the whole speech and language therapy department in Lucina are signed up for training. We've also got psychologists um, on the list, uh, social workers, nurses, uh, social care workers, um, and I, one or two occupational therapists as well. So we have the full remit of the multidisciplinary team, um, apart from psychiatry, all signed up to do two days of training with yourself. And then we've also extended it to outside agencies. Um, so anybody in any country in the world, in any service, is um, more than welcome to attend. We do still have services available. Um, and we have extended the early bird rate as well. So um, we're really excited to host it and proud to host uh, such an innovative program in Dublin. Excellent. So if, um, and I will repeat this at the end in case um, anyone is interested, um, um, uh, I guess possibly the easiest at this point, we forgot to talk about this bit, Deirdre, um, is if people just possibly contact us and we'll link you in with, with the team at Lucina um, because we haven't put any other contact details on the slide, so it might be hard. But if you just go to our website and inquire or send an email to us, we'll link you in with Katie, who's coordinating. It might be easiest. Um, and that is in mid-October, that training, but you would need to apply um, if, way before that. When's the closing date? Sorry, I've forgotten. That's okay, the closing date is mid-September. Mid-September, yeah. Yeah, right. mid-September, so there's a bit of time. Yeah, fantastic. Now, um, you also had some tips and tricks for people considering running SAS in terms of how to um, seek funding for maybe it's getting an initial pilot to see if you can get interest within your own services or if it's about the general way in which you run and run it and seek funding. Are you able to talk about some of that local funding opportunity? Yeah, thanks, Kathleen. I suppose it's important to say that Lucina is um, is a government organisation, um, so it is a registered charity. So families attend free of charge, um, and funding for Lucina in and of itself is provided by Ireland's Health Service Executive or the HSE, and then it's also partially funded by voluntary contributions that are made to St. the St John of God Community Services. Um, and I think because we're a government run organization and because there is a cost component to Lucina, that was another reason why we felt it was really important to prove that what we were doing was going to work. Um, we had to prove that this intervention was going to be cost effective. And, and thankfully, we got those results, um, which does prove it. But at, when we did the training with you, I remember sitting in Cardiff, in the room, worrying so much about how to get funding because we have never ever charged or you know had to had delivered a program where there was a cost to it. So I was in a state of high anxiety, wondering, Kathleen, how are we going to get the money to run SAS? Um, but it's funny; it's only when you look for something that you find that there is actually this whole other world out there that we didn't know existed. And so myself, Geraldine and Katie have been working in Lucina for 40 years collectively, which is quite sad. Um, but Wonderful, it's not sad. <laughs> we, we didn't know that there was this whole other part to our organization that supports um, staff funding for initiatives. Um, so we have been very fortunate but most of the funding we've received has not been from within Lucina at all. So I think it's important for other people, particularly those working in state funded organizations in Ireland, to know that we haven't received funding from within our own organization. We have gone outside it and that it is possible for, for other clinicians to do exactly the same thing. Um, we have had support from our development company who, who who look after the fundraising, so they have directed us in terms of different grants that are available. So we've learned a lot and it has been a really interesting process for us in terms of applying for grants and putting together proposals. 
Um, so we've learned things like um, to, to seek funding from some initiatives, you will need or your organization will need what's called a CHY number, um, which stands for a charity number. So if you work for a charity organization, such as in Ireland, another big one would be Enable Ireland, um, they already have charity numbers. So it makes it a little bit easier to, to seek funding in that way. Um, but within the HSC, there are different grants available that we would never have known existed either and we're funded by the HSC and we received um, a grant of 5,000 euro through the HSC um, under the remit of the Irish Lotto. Um, we also got funding from um, Ireland's Electricity Supply Board. They had a grant for managing um, suicide prevention and mental health promotion. We got another 5,000 euro from them. Again, a grant that I would never have known existed prior <laughs> to looking for the money. Um, but there are other community grant initiatives, such as those offered by bigger corporations like Coca-Cola. Um, the supermarkets in Ireland, I don't know if it's the same in Australia, but they do a blue token um, charity drive where you, you um, apply to raise money for different charities and the members of the public put a token in a box um, for the charity that they feel deserves the best and these are local charities um, so it is possible to look not too far for money from even where your location is and then there are other social initiative grants there are local authority grants we read about one on a bus stop it was from the <laughs> council um, so there is actually a lot of money out there, believe it or not, <laughs> that is ring fenced for um, innovative projects, for um, therapeutic interventions, particularly in the area of mental health, which is a big, uh, big, huge national concern here in Ireland. Um, so I would really urge clinicians not to be put off by the fact that there is a monetary component to SAS, because if we can do it, anybody can. Um, we've also come across a really good website called thewheel.ie and um, this is an online database that gives really helpful tips to clinicians or practitioners or educators for how to access funding grants uh, within Ireland. Um, they have a monthly newsletter that if you sign up to they give lists of all the different types of grants that are available that month and the, the deadlines that go with the grants. So it, it's the type of thing that once you start looking for it, you can find it, but you may not even know these type of funding opportunities exist at this current time. And you've been, um, it, it's really wonderful to hear how successful you've been, Deirdre, when, as you said, you had, didn't know and you hadn't done this before, um, but you've been, you've been able to, to do so much um, through that bit of knowledge. So thank you for passing that on. I think that's all very, very helpful stuff for everyone. <laughs> um, was there anything more that you wanted to say on that topic? No, nope, I think that's nope. all good. Um, I will add, anyone who's watching this who's maybe not from Ireland, whether it's um, UK, Europe, Australia, America, Canada, um, it won't be the same list that's on the screen, but the, our facilitators and SS provider organisations uh, in multiple countries get, get funding for all sorts of different things. Um, when they when they go and find it, look out for it. Yeah, and if you're ever doing that, and there's some way that we can help you, as back at SAS headquarters, um, do let us know how you think we could help, or ask the question. Um, even an example: the the photograph of Deirdre standing next to her poster, the intention to run a, a research poster. Um, from memory, we did the graphic design help on that one have the template where you could put in the uh, the background, the introduction, all of those elements into the poster. So, so do get in touch and see how we can help. Now, we've been talking a little bit about research, referring to research. Um, so I thought it's only fair to, to help those people curious know about the evidence base behind the program. Um, and Deirdre has mentioned this one, that the original randomised control trial, this is where it all started. So SAS was Renee Beaumont's PhD project. It was the development and evaluation of um, what was then called the Junior Detective Training Program. Um, but of course, the, the kiddies gave feedback that that wasn't very cool uh, and, and the name got changed to Secret Agent Society. But that reference, if you ever see reference to that one, 
Um, that was the original randomized control trial that, that started it all, and to my knowledge, is still holding the highest clinical change published for a program of its kind. Now, in terms of where the research has gone since then, there's a, a lot of studies that have continued to focus on the autism spectrum population, um, and some of which I have listed on the slide here. I'm not going to go through the details of all of these research studies. However, on our website, there is an evidence page that has um, a written sort of narrative summary of, of the research, plus all the formal references if you want to go and download the journal articles that are published. Um, so since that time, there's been a study with ASPECT and the University of Sydney here in Australia where they applied SAS in what are called satellite classes across five school districts um, in New South Wales, Australia. Um, so they're like, they're, they're the equivalent to say a special needs or a learning support unit. So small classrooms of all kids with, with autism in this case. Um, and in that study, they evaluated SAS head to head with their social emotional curriculum at the time. The program was delivered by teachers and they had one year follow-up data. So that one's uh, there if you want to download and have a look at that. Anyone who may be from a school setting, um, you might be interested in that. There's also been um, another applied research study um, similar to Deirdre's story, people who have run SAS and they've integrated it into their research um, portfolio. We're in, um, sorry, this is the Developmental Disabilities Clinic in the Children's Hospital LA attached to um, University of Southern California. So that's the, the third dot point on my slide there. So that's around adaptations and evaluating delivery in a community hospital clinic where the parents, um, there's a high population of Spanish speaking um, families with parents who are Spanish speaking, but children English speaking in English speaking schools. So that had a whole different set of challenges to delivery that they address in that, that article. Um, there's also been evaluations of uh, in mainstream schools um, and a few of those, what we call local community implementation projects. They're what Deirdre and her, her setting have called pilots to show, the, to show the service in the community that it works in your settings. There's been a few of those around the world. There's also been um, studies looking into other social emotional challenges, such as the one at Lucina Clinic. Um, there was a, a replication, a, a little, um, little trial of it that's currently been accepted for publication um, with children who were confirmed not on the autism spectrum. Um, Deirdre will tell us more about the population in hers. Um, where Renee is at the moment is at Will Connell in New York. And they're currently, I think, finishing up a randomised control trial of SAS small group within an autism clinic, an anxiety clinic and an ADHD clinic. Um, and then there's another CAMS study, actually, that's just started in Australia as well. Um, so there's quite a few people looking at um, beyond autism in terms of the application of the small group program, which is really great to see because there really is, as, as Deirdre said, the first time she read the the first study, the randomised control trial from 2008, you were from that point thinking, hey, this would be relevant to us here, where we have a whole range of children. Um, now, some, some other research has been looking at different ways of delivering SAS. So there's a, study, a couple of research groups that have been looking at individual delivery, using the small group program protocols and resources, but to work one-on-one, -on -one, maybe small groups not suitable, uh, or there isn't enough children for a small group, <laughs> there's another option. Um, but the small group program has, has higher results. There's something called um, remote delivery, which has been um, in research stages of, of um, development and evaluation. This is the idea where a trained SAS facilitator is supporting a family to deliver an intervention at home if they can't actually come and participate or can't reach a professional. Maybe... Um, uh, in Australia, we have a very large country, maybe there's someone living a very long way away from any cities where there's professionals trained uh, and there are family who are willing and able to connect remotely with a trained professional and try and deliver an intervention at home with their kids with that professional support. So there's that that's been um, evaluated with a couple of publications or a pen and a pending pub publication. Um, there's also been um, a two-year trial of the new whole of class secret agent society program um, that was uh, evaluated here in Australia. So that's something different once again. Again, that's not for the kids identified with, with social emotional difficulties. That's for all kids in a mainstream classroom. 
So there's a whole heap of different research going on. Um, but I'd really love to hear a little bit more about Lucina's process with their evaluation and, uh, and also the, the preliminary results. Okay, thanks, Kathleen. So we, I think I mentioned already, we um, worked with 51 children. Um, we stuck within the, um, you know, the required age range of SAS, 8 to 12 years. Um, the children were referred to the project by the consultant child and adolescent psychiatrists on each of the three teams. So in order to, to try and minimize bias, we weren't involved in the recruitment process. The, the consultant psychiatrists were the gatekeepers. And we used purpose of sampling. So we had quite strict inclusion and exclusion criteria. So the consultants um, offered the program to the parents. And once all the consents were signed, then we met them and went through the um, initial consultation sessions. Um, and then did the small group program the way you've mentioned with um, the four uh, two hour parent training sessions and then the nine weekly cadet sessions. So from our purpose of sampling, we got um, quite an even spread of diagnoses in, in terms of the, what the children were presenting with. So because they were in Lucina, they all had to have a moderate to severe mental health difficulty. But the, the diagnoses ranged from, we had about just over a fifth had autism, um, another fifth had ADHD, another fifth had anxiety disorder. And then we had um, kids who had mixed diagnoses or comorbid difficulties. So another fifth had ADHD and autism. And then just under a fifth had anxiety disorder and autism. So these were quite complex kids, Kathleen, um, you know, some of them would have presented with suicidal ideation, um, very low mood, depression. Uh, some of the kids in the research cohort were out of school or were, were on shortened days. Sorry, they weren't fully out of yeah. school or we couldn't get teachers involved, but they were on shortened days. They may have had a history of expulsion due to um, uh, challenging behavior in school. So they were quite a complex um, bunch of kids. Um, so yeah, we followed the format of SAS. Um, we definitely would advocate for the, having the teacher um, preparation session as a compulsory part of SAS. When we did the pilot, the first time Geraldine Brosnan and I did the pilot, we didn't do the two hour training sessions for the teachers because it was optional, an optional part of the program. And yeah. we um, but we felt that we didn't get the teachers on board as much as we would have liked. So for the remaining 12 children in the pilot, we um, uh, invited the teachers to the two-hour session. And, and that's the way we do it ever since. Can I ask, um, Deirdre, did they come to you to the clinic or did you go out and do many sessions at, at the schools? We've been absolutely overwhelmed by the interest and support of teachers, Kathleen. Like, we can't believe it. The main reason we didn't invite them in the optional format was we felt the teachers wouldn't be able to be released from school if we did it during school hours. Yeah. Yeah. And it would be fair to ask them to commit to after school hours. Um, but then we decided she would just offer it and see because we didn't feel that they were fully on board without it. And since so that's going back years now, we've always had full attendance with the teacher training sessions and they come to us in our clinic. Wow. Um, we're at full capacity. Um, often the teachers bring other teachers with them. So we've had a few principals, principals of the schools. We've had especially learning support teachers, resource teachers, as well as the class teacher. And I think it just really highlights the prevalence of emotional regulation difficulties in kids and how the teachers are really at a loss for how to support them yeah um, and have difficulties within the mainstream class so all of the um all of our kids who come to SAS are in mainstream school um, usually when we're doing the two-hour training with them they always say um i know we're here for the SAS child but there are at least five other kids in our class that we know uh -huh. <laughs> Obviously um, valuable information for them to take that time out and to think of all the other students. That's, that's wonderful. 
Um, and in their feedback forms, many of the teachers have commented on how it has benefited not just the SAS child, but other kids in the classroom. Um, so that's really powerful and such an effective use of, of two hours. Yeah. Um, would you like me to move on to the results slide for you, Deidre? Please. So we, um, we use the ERSSQ and the SSQ. So these are the assessment measures recommended by SAS and the um, evaluation forms for the parents and the teachers and the children at four time points. So we did them before SAS started, after uh, the nine weeks for the kids and the four training sessions for the parents. And then we did them at three months follow up. So the kids and their parents all came for separate three month follow up groups and then at six months. Um, so although we had 51 children, we actually had about 147 participants in the project when you you can for each child have one teacher, um, each child had at least one parent, and in many cases we had two questionnaires from both um, a mom and a dad. So we have a huge amount of data, um, and we were very relieved to get statistically significant improvements in both the kids' social communication skills and the emotional regulation skills across both home and school settings. So that was based on the parent feedback and the teacher feedback. Um, and so importantly, we got maintenance of these results at six months post. So it's proving that the results um, extend out into real life past the completion of the program. Yeah. It, yeah, it, it really is great. And, and I love these extra questions that you also asked, um, Deirdre. Yeah, we, I suppose, again, going back to the monetary component of SAS, we really need to prove that what we're doing works and that it has longevity if we're going to be investing in this program financially. Um, so one of the questions that's included on the program evaluation part of the questionnaires um, is asked to both parents and teachers. And it, for parents, um, it asks, do you believe the SAS program has contributed to lasting changes in your child's skills and or behavior? And from the teachers, it asks in relation to the child's classroom and or playground behavior. And we got almost equal results for both. So 75% of both parents and teachers, when asked at six months follow-up, felt that the kids um, had, uh, or SAS had contributed to lasting changes. In behavior which is amazing it is it certainly is it, so you saw it in the data over six months and then you saw that they were believing that that was providing lasting changes and I absolutely love this graph because I yeah. suppose this is one of many hidden benefits of SAS that maybe aren't always picked up on in the outcome measures is the importance of um, how it shapes parental behavior in managing um, the kids' difficulties. So another question on the form is asked of parents, do you believe the SAS program has contributed to lasting changes in how you support your child? So it's not, a, it's not related to the child themselves. And we got 84% of the parents who responded said yes, that SAS had um, impacted on how they support their kids. Uh, and in their qualitative feedback, a lot of the parents commented on how um, they have learned lifelong skills to support their kids and that they hope that SAS will, that their kids can reap the benefits of SAS in the years to come. So you can't really put a price on, on, on that, Kathleen. You know? no, no. There's another one. I, I, I don't know if you mind me putting you on the spot like this. There was a, a child quote that you gave me once around the, the perception of your service on the hill. Yes, this was a, she was one of our older participants. She was 12 and she'd been coming to Eugenia for several years. She had autism and ADHD and her mum told us in the six month follow up Group. So it wasn't noted on the questionnaire, but she told us um, verbally that her daughter used to call Lucina the evil place on the hill, um, which doesn't say much for Lucina, but since coming to SAS, um, she calls it the, the yellow house on the hill. Yeah, um, I'm happy to know, go there. 
<laughs> another um, father told us about how his, the colours in his daughter's drawings had um, brightened so much. She was really into art um, and she used to do a lot of drawing and um, during and after SAS he noticed that her drawings became much more colourful. Wow. And he to attendance at SAS because a lot of the parents also spoke about how the children's confidence had improved a lot. Um, and I think there is definitely this sense of that the children's difficulties are normalized now. They, they have been in a really safe and secure environment where they can freely talk about emotions and hear about other children's difficulties managing them, but they're also empowered with new strategies to cope. Um, and all of these things together seem to just improve their confidence. Fantastic feedback, Deirdre. Um, now, that I understand you're also presenting this work at a conference. Is it in November? Have I got that right? Yeah. September. That's less than a month away now. Oh, September. Actually, <laughs> um, presenting um, at a speech and language therapy conference called the RCSLG in the UK. It stands for the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapy Conference. So we have a, a paper slot um, in Nottingham in September. So we're really excited to present at that. Um, and then we have a huge amount of um, statistical analysis still to do. Um, we really are interested in things like do different diagnostic um, uh, classifications do better, so do the children with autism do better or do the kids who have anxiety disorders do better? Um, we want to know about age ranges, do the older kids do better than the younger kids or not? Um, we're also really interested in the qualitative aspects. We have at the moment I think about 60 typed pages of qualitative feedback, so we need to do really in-depth analysis on that. Um, and we particularly like to look at the children's experiences of coming to SAS yeah. and also the dads. The dads are really underrepresented in the research literature. Um, you know, what was it like for the fathers? Um, some of whom came to the parent training sessions, some of whom didn't, but they still answered the, the parent questionnaires. So we'll probably be analysing this data for many years to come. <laughs> So there'll be a little bit now, a little bit in September at the conference, and then a little bit the next year. <laughs> well, it's all, it all sounds so um, fantastic and interesting, and I look forward to hearing all of how it, you know, how it unveils over time. Yeah. yeah. And obviously that you're, you're also hoping that um, through spreading the word and inviting other services to small group program that other, other services and other families in, in Ireland and, and UK can, can benefit from what you're seeing as well. Um, I love that. that um, I love that you have that broad, broader passion and want to empower the broader community to, to do that. It's wonderful. Yeah. Similarly to what you have found with the, the whole school approach, that's what we tell the kids when they come to SAS is ideally we would like this to be in all schools in Ireland taught as the part of the national curriculum. But at the moment, I think we're the only um, outpatient clinic running SAS in Ireland and we have to start small and then try and branch out. So the next plan will be following the training in October that all of the clinics in Lucina will be offering SAS. Um, and then we have other conferences to present within Ireland and special interest groups for mental health and autism and speech and language therapy to present that too. So hopefully we can try and start spreading the word or answer any questions other therapists might have um, about getting SAS into their services. Yeah, definitely deserving of the, uh, the title Special Agent D. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, well, we Kathleen, Geraldine Brosnan and Katie Maguire, it's the three of us. Yes, together. you're all the Special Agent um, SAS Irish Bureau. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and uh, we, we, uh, we love working with you guys and supporting you on all of, whether it's running a marathon or presenting a poster or... Um, <laughs> um, walking a marathon, Kathleen, walking. Sorry, walking a marathon. <laughs> Uh, now, uh, those of you who are very new to SAS um, and perhaps haven't even looked around on the website yet, um, wouldn't possibly know the, the origins and, and where we fit. I do, I do like to just let people know some of the context of 
of us as the distributor of Secret Agent Society. So I'm from the Social Skills Training Institute um, and we distribute the Secret Agent Society globally. Um, but we're wholly owned by uh, a not-for-profit uh, organisation in Australia. It's actually an international collaborative organisation, but it's Australian um, organisation called the Autism CRC, which is short for Cooperative Research Centre for Living with Autism. Um, and as the as Secret Agent Society program was originally designed for autism, um, that's, that's why the, the connection there. Um, so we're wholly owned by that entity and they um, are a cooperative research centre with organisations across Australia and internationally. Um, so service providers, advocacy groups, universities uh, across the country, um, other industry corporate partners, all sorts of different groups that come together to drive research to make meaningful changes in people's lives. Um, you can see on the slide there's three core areas or there has been three core areas um, to date, the early years, which is predominantly around diagnosis. Um, CRC has been, uh, a CRC project has been quite, um, or has led the development of Australian um, national guidelines for diagnosis of autism. That's an example. Um, in the school years, there's all sorts of things on teaching practices, classroom design, um, the evaluation of the whole of class secret agent society program um, or falls under that school years category. Um, in the adulthood category, the Autism CRC uh, is looking at research in um, recruitment, employment processes, access to healthcare. Um, uh, what else am I forgetting about? Employment, education, accessing the community. Um, so there's all sorts of different cooperative or collaborative research going on. Uh, a lot of it, is, or all of it, is co-produced as well um, with people on the spectrum or who are a part of or helping the uh, research teams. So I guess why I want to bring this, this piece together is because we are a wholly owned entity of that Autism CRC, uh, any profits that Secret Agent Society um, may produce for the Social Skills Training Institute actually goes into the CRC as our parent organisation to help fund the research that's going on more broadly. Um, so yeah, it's, it's usually a nice thing for people to, to be aware of. Um, but that's... Uh, that's all, Deirdre, and all I have for you uh, today on this webinar, but please do feel free to jump on the website that's uh, on the slide there to contact us, um, and I'll put you in touch with the Irish team if you're interested in their training. Um, we, can, we can answer a lot of questions between the two of us. <laughs> um, but thank you very much for listening. Hope that's been helpful, uh, and enjoy the rest of your day wherever you may be.